Hello. The Warhammer world was the work of countless games designers, writers, artists, and creators. It developed over many decades and many products, but there were some key individuals who helped drive that creation. My guest today was one of the architects of the early Warhammer world through Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, responsible for some of its finest writing, some of its funnest adventures, and for its continued presence as a grim and perilous setting for the greatest of role-playing campaigns. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Graham Davis. Thank you so much for joining me. I wonder if we might start by just talking a little bit about how you came to be working at Games Workshop in the in the mid eighties. Um, sure. Yeah. I uh, well, to start at the beginning, um, I finished school in nineteen seventy six, but I didn't have the grades to get into uni, so I took a job in a bank for three years and studied by correspondence and. Um, the bank job really, I was a really bad fit for that. So, um, to kind of keep myself sane as a hobby, um, I joined a local Amdram group <laughs> and as it so happened, this was in Bracknell in Berkshire and, uh, the computer company ICL had a big, uh, uh, presence there at the time. I think they're part of Fujitsu Siemens now. Uh, anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, but there were some some of the younger lads in the uh, in the drama club <clears throat> had uh, just uh, finished college themselves, and they would picked up a game there called Dungeons and Dragons. And they tried to explain it to me, and they said it's sort of fifty percent miniatures war game and fifty percent improvised theatre. And I could not reconcile those two in my mind. So I thought there's only one thing for it. I'll have to go along and see what it's really about. Um, and by 1977 or so, we were playing pretty much every weekend. and I was completely hooked. And when I did go to uni, I took that with me. Um, and of course, I was by that time I was subscribing to White Dwarf. And uh, they put out, uh, there was a, a, they were bi-monthly at the time. And there was always readers letters saying, when are you going to go monthly? When are you going to go monthly? And Jamie Thompson, who was the editor at the time, uh, made a, a severe tactical error by saying, well, we don't have the content. Um, so I, <laughs> for the next two years or so, I was sending them three or four articles a month until they finally realized I wasn't going to go away and they published one. <laughs> And this was in White Dwarf 32, uh, which was, I think, June, July 1982. And um, uh, it worried several people who'd known, you know, uh, because it was actually a subsystem for, for seedy living and drug addiction and stuff like that, uh, which you could publish for AD&D in those days. <laughs> um, probably not publishable today at all. Anyway, um, the in due course, a small check appeared, and that was it. Uh, I went straight to the college bar, <laughs> exchanged the check into to Theakston's XB with all due dispatch, and then uh, went back to my room to write more. Uh, and then fast forward four years when uh, I was uh, working on a PhD project that uh, was not going well, and... Um, Oh, in the meantime, I'd started writing for Imagine as well. Hmm. Uh, and um, Games Workshop knew me by that time as a reliable freelancer. And they were putting a team together to do Warhammer Fantasy role play. And uh, I like to tell people that, you know, uh, G uh, Jim Bamber and Phil Gallagher came across from TSR UK. But Graham Morris didn't. Uh, he wanted to stay in Cambridge and, and continue his academic life. Uh, so there was a vacancy for a Graham. And so I got a job. <laughs> um, so around about May 1986, I, I moved down from, from Durham and uh, started working in, in Nottingham. Uh, and uh, there was a huge draft or actually probably three partial drafts by uh 
uh, Rick Priestley, Richard Hallowell and Brian Ansell that I started to fold together and sort out. And uh, yeah, that's how I got started. <laughs> right. Wow. So you came in and you were just sort of thrown in the deep end then to take a look at this enormous <laughs> ongoing project. Yes, it was like here, you know, about role playing games have this because they were all uh, they were all war games designers, uh, you know, because uh, what originally Wolfrop, uh was intended or Warhammer role players, it was known then was intended as a one off supplement for for Warhammer second edition, the red box version. Um, and uh, that's where all these piles of stuff came from. And that's how some of the systems ended up the way they are. Because uh, if you look at the skills in uh, Wolf First Edition, they're just one-offs. You either have them or you don't. And that really points to the origins in war games design because they're essentially unit traits. And uh, uh, there wasn't really time to, to fix that and turn it into a percentage-based skill system because I arrived in May. We had to get the thing to the printers in October to ship in November for the Christmas market of 1986, and that was set in stone. So... <laughs> So that must have been quite a job then for for you and the the guys coming from TSR UK to to turn it, was, it into something yeah. that was sellable. It, it it was, you know, we'd uh, we'd all uh, also, you know, I think uh, Brian in particular was expecting uh, basically a dungeon bash game. He wanted it, uh, in his words, to stand toe to toe with D and D. But Jim and Phil and I and the other folks from TSR, Paul Coburn, Mike Brunton, uh, Tom Kirby, uh, we'd all been exposed to the early editions of Call of Cthulhu. And we had a very different idea of where the state of the art was in terms of role playing games. Hmm. Uh, and that's kind of the impetus of, of how Wolfrop developed a very different flavor from Warhammer Battle. Yeah, because it did. It, it really took to a, a much lower level version of mm. that world right and started to explore yeah. it in that way but it was so who yeah. was the sort of was it really a collaborative effort with with everyone kind of steering it in that way did it evolve organically into that sort of slightly different version of the world yeah i i don't think a, a firm decision was ever taken uh you know as a matter of policy this is how we're going to do it it's just we we all had this shared view of this is what a role-playing game needs to be in late 1986 um and uh, also in a way it was kind of a reaction to everything that frustrated us about uh D, &D at the time that uh, you know it was sort of simplistic hack and slash um there was a, a kind of a culture war going on at the time particularly in the london fanzines um where uh because younger players were coming into the game around that time uh, it was no longer a, a sort of an undergraduate secret. <laughs> and, um, you know, imagine uh, used to have some subscribers as young as eight years old. And so they were all into, you know, how many times can you kill uh, Orcus and get, you know, how many versions of his wand can you get for your character? And um, <clears throat> and this was looked down a bit by uh, on by the, uh, the people who dubbed themselves role gamers, who's... Uh, uh, what they used to boast about was how they had gamed for an entire weekend and never touched the dice once. Um, and we were, you know, we, we were sort of tending to, to, to the latter camp, although we weren't sort of firm uh, advocates of either approach. But we just thought it was far more interesting, you know, having to be low powered in a hostile world. Um, you have to remember this was also the Thatcher era. Uh, it was uh, two years after the miners' strike, and uh, you know, being good sort of left-leaning, lower middle class and middle class uh, college graduates, uh, that was kind of our mindset as well. And there's a certain amount of satire in there, particularly in the way the the nobles, the nobility of the empire is described. Uh, because at the time that the current Earl Spencer was Viscount Althorpe Champagne Charlie, as he was known, and the Bullingdon Club was in full cry, wrecking restaurants and debagging waiters. And uh, uh, I'd seen some of that at Durham. Uh, Jim and Phil had seen a lot more at Cambridge. And so, uh, you know, it was just kind of our, our shared mindset. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that then all sort of came together. Because so, it really does feel a bit like that the, the alchemy of taking Dungeons and & Dragons and the influences from that that have gone into Warhammer Fantasy Battle at that point as well. And mm. like you say, that Call of Cthulhu sort of sl- approach. So w- were you thinking there was going to be more than just that one supplement at that point as it sort of started to grow as a thing? Or was it still just yeah. get this one done and then move on to something else? No, no. I think by the time they brought on a team of uh, of role-playing writers, uh, you know, that, that was implicit uh commitment that it was going to be a, a range it was going to be a product line um and at the time of course um citadel and games workshop had just merged um tsr uk was now handling ad and d which had been a big earner in the early days of uh, of games workshop um and uh, although we still had uh, license agreements with Chaosium over RuneQuest and Call of Cthulhu and subsequently Stormbringer and a couple of others, um, I think there was the, the need was felt for a flagship role-playing game and particularly a fantasy one to, uh, as it, Brian's exact words were, to stand toe and toe, to toe with AD&D. Um, and, you know, it was a logical uh, offshoot to grow the Warhammer brand as well. Yeah, yeah, it does make a, a lot of sense from that business perspective as well to to give mm. you another avenue to start fleshing out that world. I mean, what was that approach? To, what, how did you sort of go about adding the, the flesh to the bones of the Warhammer world, as it were? Because even in second edition of the Fantasy Battle game, there still wasn't as, as clear a version of the Warhammer world as we might recognize it today that obviously started to come together with all the supplements and extra stuff. But what was that process like for you? Um, well, the, the, the work had already partially been done, um, in the, the drafts that awaited me. I think Rick had tried to, uh, get everything together. I also combed back through all the Citadel journals and compendia and, uh, miniatures ads and everything. And I tried to gather together every little bit of setting that had uh, ever seen print. Um, and then kind of uh, put it together in a way that worked and flesh out the details, uh, fill in the gaps. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of, and at that time it was only one chapter in the book. So it wasn't that big a job. Uh, a lot was done with the enemy within uh, to flesh out the empire. Um, and uh, you know, the intention long-term was to do the similar thing to other parts of the world. Hal was working on it. Richard Hallowell was working on his Lustria campaign mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, which is now passed into legend. And, uh, we were thinking of doing, uh, I mean, there was always the constant pressure to do Albion because we were a British role playing game. Um, of which there were very few at that time. Um, we weren't the first, but we might have been the second. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, uh, as I said, it was only one chapter, so it, it wasn't uh, too bad, particularly as we were focusing on the Empire. And Jim and Phil, when they were sketching out the outlines of the enemy within campaign, um, they took uh, what was written for the Empire and, and fleshed it out into, I think, what what ended up being about half of that world setting chapter. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that Enemy Within campaign, just on that, was like a very, I mean, that obviously has stood the test of time. It's it's a highly regarded campaign, really the, the sort of the pinnacle of sort of long form campaign writing for a lot of role players. Uh, obviously, mm. there was a, a lot of collaborative work in, in that as well. Uh, how, mm. how did you sort of get stuck into that? Well, um, initially, uh before Jim and Phil came on board, Brian uh, came to me and, uh, and asked me to write the, the first module, uh, using the language of the day. And he said he wanted, these were his exact words, a bloodless Call of Cthulhu adventure for Warhammer. Uh, so the result was Shadows over Bergenhafen. Uh, and uh, when Jim and Phil arrived, they they had just done a, a module for... I think it was, yeah, it was Beckme D&D. It was the basic B 
BX1, otherwise known as B10, called Night's Dark Shadow, which was supposed to be a transitional module to get you from basic to expert rules um, and uh, introduce the concept of campaign play. So they put a lot of thought into that. It is still, uh, in my opinion, an outstanding module. Uh, they'd set up a campaign sandbox area before sandbox was even the term people used and seeded various adventures around the place. Um, so they they probably, in, in Britain at least, were the experts on what a, a role-playing campaign was. And they were the driving force behind that. They um, they incorporated Shadows over Bogenhafen as, as one episode, hmm. uh, but it really hit its stride with Death on the Reich and then power behind the throne. Um, and the way we worked was that Jim and Phil were, were very used to working together very closely. Um, Jim was a great ideas guy and Phil was a great organizer. Um, and so they would be working on one thing, I would be working on another, and then we'd switch and develop each other's work. So, uh, you know, they developed uh, Shadows Over Bogenhaf and I developed The Enemy Within slash Mistaken Identity. Um, and then when Death on the Right came around, they handled the adventure and uh, I wrote the, the River Life of the Empire supplement. Uh, and uh, it, it continued sort of in that vein until I, I got rather pigeonholed as a developer of other people's work. Uh, which was a little frustrating at times, although I still wrote stuff for uh, for White Dwarf. Yeah, you were doing quite a lot of, of White Dwarf uh, articles and, and stuff as well through that time, it seems. In particular, one of my favourites being the Marienburg series that right. you did. Yeah. Yeah, and, you, and you, you know, that was an incredible undertaking. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what sort of drove the creation of Marienburg in, in those pages. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, uh, we have to skip back to Imagine, and they had a, an ongoing serialized setting called uh, the City League, uh, set in the world of Pelinor, but mainly the City League was the influence, was the uh, emphasis. And uh, every issue, they had six or eight pages, uh, you know, two or three locations with NPCs and adventure seeds. And um, I don't know if you go back far enough to remember those part works that used to appear in WH Smith's where you could sort of get a magazine each month and it built up into an encyclopedia. Oh yeah. The, you know, yeah. so few, so few of them ever reach conclusion, but uh, <laughs> so it was that sort of approach to creating a fantasy setting uh, and in particular a fantasy city. Now at that time there were supplements out for fantasy cities uh, in the early days, there had been um, the city-state of the Invincible Overlord. Uh, but uh, more recently, TSR had reduced, produced their, their Lankmar supplement for AD&D, &D, uh, which was a very good city supplement. Um, and there were a couple of others who I can't call to mind right now. But uh, we wanted to do something like that was another sort of thing, like um, it was something a role playing game should have. It was uh, it was another sort of element of the state of the art. Um, plus, uh, given the sort of grubby tone of, of Woofrup, uh, an urban setting uh, was something that we really needed. And uh, there, we did do uh, Middenheim. Uh, for uh, to support power behind the throne, and that was very well received. But uh, Tom Kirby and Mike Brunton and I were, were still kind of interested in doing the the serialized thing because it, it could be completely open ended. You didn't have to work to a particular deadline, and uh, also it had this modular quality where people could just sort of pick and choose what they wanted and drop them into their own campaigns. Uh, they didn't have to use the whole thing. Um, so eventually it was decided to do that in Marienburg. Uh, we got a freelancer called Anthony Reagan to uh, kick it off. And he, he went on to become, you know, quite a figure and uh, still is very active in Wolfram fandom, particularly first, first edition. And uh, I need some more tea. <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
Let's see if that gets my mouth moving better. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we decided, uh, and it was part of Flames Remit when that was set up, um, that we would produce uh, one book of uh, 80 to 128 pages every two months, I think it was, uh, plus eight pages for uh, White Dwarf Monthly. And that was mostly going to be Marion Bird, but a few other things kind of came along, um, like sort of promotional pieces for uh, uh the novels we we uh, started Gotrek and Felix, for example, hmm. uh, or for or little excerpts of uh, forthcoming products like the Doomstones. Yeah, yeah. So the, you you started up Constant Drakenfels as well, which uh, seems like a, right. bold, a bold campaign choice for anybody who's, who's going to put him in a an adventure. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, D and D had Vecna. <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, you know, Brian's uh, when he he said he wanted us to write a, a dungeon uh, based on Castle Drakenfels, uh, he said he it was to be Warhammer's answer to uh, the the Tomb of Horrors S one. You know, it was supposed to be the dungeon that everybody talked about and nobody beat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like that was quite a success then. Uh, in, yeah, in those terms, yeah. So you mentioned there about the the setup of Flame uh, publications mm. as well. So that was the sort of spun off, dedicated imprint that was created by Games Workshop to to work yes. purely on Warframe, right? So mm. what was the the thinking going on there within the business, and so how did that work? Well, um, when uh, Warframe came out, the first edition of Forty K Rogue Trader came out one month later, almost to the day. And uh, let's just say it had more of an impact on miniature sales than Wolfram did. Sure. Um, and uh, Brian was a miniatures guy first, last and always. He always was worried about not being able to make money off of paper products. So uh, from that point on, the writing was on the wall for, for role playing games. You know, the uh, the licensed uh, printings of the Chaosium games and a few others were uh, would one avenue to kind of get uh, role playing games out from Games Workshop, uh, keeping the costs down. Um, but still, they were still cheaper to uh, to buy in the UK than, you know, in the imported American editions. Um, and uh, looking at Wolfrup, um, well, Jim had left, uh, Phil had gone into management. Uh, we had a few, you know, we still had freelancers like Carl Sargent in particular. Um, but the idea was to cut the costs absolutely to the bone, see what we could produce and see if it would, you know, be self-sustaining fiscally. Uh, and that was the idea behind Flame. And uh, so we had me, uh, well, first we had uh, freelancers doing all the writing. Uh, I was doing the developing. Mike Brunton was doing the, the layout. Uh, he had a, a Mac and uh, a early version of Quark Express. And um, we were instructed to, to use the Games Workshop art archive as extensively as possible. Um, but uh, we also had Tony Ackland, uh, who uh, uh, he was, uh, he's, he's still alive, bless him. Uh, he's a, a phenomenal artist, the fastest I've ever known, uh, who could turn out, you know, a full page piece in a day. Um, and uh, so the three of us uh, were sent to a little office off-site just downstairs from Marauder Miniatures where they were trying to, to test the same model with miniatures production. And, uh, and off we went. And, right. uh, you know, we, we hit the production goals, certainly. But uh, the, uh, the sales figures, uh, as, as they were presented to us, we didn't get to see the raw data, but as they presented to us was that uh, it really wasn't working. Um, and then around that, that started uh, late 88, I think. Uh, and I left in October of 1990 and they, uh, various other incarnations, Mike left. And uh, I think uh, Robin Dews and Carl Sargent were on staff for, for some part of it. And it staggered along for a bit. 
Um, but after they got Castle Drakenfels out, I think, uh, you know, there wasn't really the the will within Games Workshop to continue producing role-playing games. Um, they uh, they felt that they just weren't sufficiently profitable to, to justify it. Um, and in terms of developing the setting, you know, the fourth edition was on the way with the, the first army books, and uh, that was the way the setting was developed. Um, and uh, they uh, started licensing uh, production of Woofer at first to Hogshead, and, and then they set up the, the joint venture Black Industries with Green Ronin, um, and more recently, uh, Cubicle 7. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like it, it wasn't a long period of time from the sort of highs of we've created this really important game or what would become a really important game and a long-standing game and mm. would be a sort of source of more lore and story within the Warhammer world. Those highs seem to be followed quite quickly then by the, the turnaround to actually miniatures games are going to be the driving force now for Games Workshop. That that's right. Yeah, the miniatures were far more profitable, and it, it, you know, if you think about um, the first edition, forty k hardback. Yeah, it was gorgeously produced. It was expensive. It had uh, full color on almost every page, I think. Uh, but it was one book, and that one book drove an awful lot of miniature sales. Whereas uh, the core Wolfram rule book didn't. Um, the early editions of the enemy within uh, up to, I, I think, uh, yeah, enemy within Shadows Over Bogenhaf and then Death on the Reich, they included flyers for miniature sales, uh, including some bespoke miniatures for, for the NPCs and everything. Um, but no role player, really, no GM was going to spend a, 150 pounds, 150 pounds in 1986, uh, on a set of miniatures for one adventure. And, sure. uh, you know, that was the point at which the writing started to appear on the wall. Hmm. Was there ever, that you were party to, was there ever a conversation about doing a 40K equivalent of Wolfrop? Do you know? Um, yes, it, it was sort of in the air from the outset. Um, but you know, like Wolfrop itself, um, it kind of suffered from the fact that um, uh, role-playing games were nowhere near as profitable using Games Workshop model as, as miniature games were. Uh, uh, there were some, if I remember correctly, in some like, chapter approved and some of the early supplements, there were some rules options which were uh, tended a little more towards role-playing. Sure, um, yeah. But, um, you know, it, it was something that, that Games Workshop never really was terribly interested in doing for themselves. Although, of course, uh, later on, uh, Fantasy Flight took it up. And I'm not sure if there were any more, uh, any earlier efforts before that. Yeah, I mean, like you say, that the original Rogue Trader had a sort of, it was kind of in a weird transitional space, I suppose, between role-playing mm. and miniatures games, and it kind of took a few bits of both, but then obviously went so much more into the miniatures space, as you say. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it just sounds like a very interesting time. A lot of changes, a lot of, like you say, state-of-the-art stuff, discovering what actual stuff works for role-playing across the industry. I mean, was it, yeah. was it an exciting time to be working on these kinds of games? Um, yeah, it certainly was. It was an exciting time, particularly to be that age and working on these kinds of games and fresh out of college. And uh, somebody once asked me what it was like in the, the writer's room of the, the Games Workshop Design Studio in those years. And the best analogy I can come up with, it was a sort of a gaming equivalent of the young ones, if you remember that TV show. <laughs> um, it was, you know, Fantastic creativity, uh, utter childishness, um, us seeing what we could get away with uh, in terms of hidden references and in-jokes before management intervened. Uh, and it was a, it was a time I, I still look back on with very great affection. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, because there's so many jokes peppered throughout those, uh, those, through those mm. books and that series. And I think that definitely contributed to the 
the feel of of Warhammer as a like you said a satirical setting as well, uh, but one that yeah. was willing to have a bit of fun with the uh, with the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we were almost all of us are blessed with the the same irreverent slash childish sense of humor, and we just fed off each other in a quite shameful way on occasion. <clears throat> and uh, and yeah, it, it was a, a, a lot of fun. And, you know, the way we justified it was that, well, it's basically a fantasy horror game, but the horror doesn't mean anything without the humor to leaven it. And, you know, it's been a criticism leveled against uh, later editions uh, or later versions not just of Wolfram but of Warhammer that it just all got too grim dark and relentless hmm. yeah it was definitely a good balance during those those early years I mean what was it yeah. like working with Rick Priestley on on the sort of various Warhammer products um oh we got along together tremendously well because uh strange thing there was a great correlation uh between role-playing writers of that time and people who had archaeology degrees i did rick did nigel stillman did graham morris who stayed at tsr also did um and the rest of the crew were self-taught historians because they'd started with historical wargaming um but Rick and I used to used to tease each other because uh, he he was a medieval specialist, whereas I was a prehistorian, and uh, so we had lots of little in jokes going there that wouldn't mean anything to anyone who hadn't graduated in archaeology in the eighties. So I won't bore you with them here. But um, yeah, uh, we we got along very well at that time. Uh, after I came on board, and he gleefully offloaded Woofer upon me. Uh, he went straight into designing 40K. So, you know, we sat at adjacent desks and we could have conversations about things, but um, we were definitely kind of in separate worlds at that point. Hmm. Um, Do you think there's anything in the... Because uh, obviously the archaeology, you're looking into the past and exploring worlds that did exist in yeah. fantasy and, and sort of war game creation. You're You're doing that but you're looking into a world that didn't exist and, and making it exist. You think that's a sort of what's going on there? It's the same kind of... Oh, oh de definitely, yes, because, you know, most fantasy, particularly uh, in those days, most fantasy ha was set at a medieval social and technological level. So we knew about that stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of the Marienburg stuff I did uh some of the the buildings like a, t a tannery and various other things businesses uh that would that came straight out of my notes from my materials technology course <laughs> right. you know i was trying to trying to sneak a little bit well reuse a little bit of what i'd learned at college and and also uh try and make it based on something real so it, it sort of rang a little more authentically hmm. um so yes, absolutely the case. <laughs> you definitely had that that ring of obviously there was it was true fantasy, but there was a ring of authenticity to the world as well. And maybe that was through that mm. lower level of adventure and power, but also the detail definitely yeah. flow through into the into the products and the stories. We yeah, we like to think so. <laughs> uh, you mentioned before Ridge to Halliwell's uh, Lustria uh, supplement. Yeah. Uh, which would never ended up being released. And I think there was also a yeah. realm of sorcery supplement that was being worked on as well. Were there any other yep. sort of things that were either, cre they were invented, but never made it or like projects that didn't get off the ground or stuff that was just left on the shelf for Warhammer? Um, yeah, there were quite a few. Um, in fact, if you don't mind me plugging, there's a great blog called uh, Awesome Lies. Uh, oh, which great. was, yeah, named after the uh, the <laughs> the news uh, column from White Dwarf back in the day, um, and uh, Gideon, who runs that, has done a, a very exhaustive sweep of the forgotten Warhammer products. Uh, the one I remember in particular was um, well, it was actually two things. There was a freelancer called Paul Vernon. Um, 
who had done uh, some stuff for White Dwarf, a lot, a lot uh, on cities and economies. He apparently he was a sociologist, um, and so he uh, wanted to design, you know, a believable fantasy society and have it working properly. And he had produced a, a self-published campaign called Starstone, um, a three adventure campaign. And on the basis of this, uh, Brian hired him to uh, write a campaign for Woofrup um, so that, you know, we didn't have all our eggs in the same enemy within basket. And um, we, uh, I have to be honest, I didn't like it. Um, and when we uh, gave him feedback, uh, not just me, but uh, feedback from the, the whole writing team, um, it became clear that communication was going to be an issue. Uh, we tried him writing a, a Norska campaign, and uh, that basically became um, a historical Viking campaign without any Warhammer flavor. And this was a perennial problem we had with, with freelancers, was capturing that Warhammer flavor because, you know, they weren't in the room with us absorbing all of our silly ideas. Um, and so what we tended to get was either um, restarted D&D &D or, uh, you know, the D&D the &D historical reference uh, or, you know, um, basically someone's college notes with game stats attached. And it, it, they, no one could, could quite nail the flavor. Um, the only person who could was, was Carl Sargent, I think. Hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, after... The, the, the initial campaign, uh, Paul tried a uh, Norska setting and then a uh, Border Princes setting, which we thought could be quite a nice um, uh, balkanized sort of Wild West, anything goes kind of uh, uh, setting. Um, but again, the communication failed us. Uh, we, we got, um, he took the word balkanized a little too literally and we got a, a sort of late ottoman empire versus austria kind of uh feel to everything um and uh anyway um yeah eventually relations broke down entirely and uh i i don't think he ever quite forgave us for uh, our response to his work hmm. well i guess like you say there is an almost ineffable something about warhammer as a world because it, it is a a merger of all of these different inspirations it seems like that and it, yeah. it does come out with a product that is something slightly different to everything that went in i mean how would you describe war the, the warhammer flavor that, that that was lacking there i mean what what was sort of the the secret um, sort of i guess if i had to characterize it it was uh uh a mixture of uh, Tolkien, 2000 AD, and the Beano, or or possibly Viz comic, if they'd done a, a skit on uh, on the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, That's you great. know those those were, those were our predominant influences at the time, for sure. <laughs> so you continue to sort of, well, in fact, the with flame and the sort of move to that I, I suppose was there anything else about the changing culture within games workshop that you remember besides the sort of increasing focus on the business of miniatures um yes i think because uh you know games workshop uh by the time i left was was reaching the end of a period of, of considerable growth and reorganization and was being much more serious as a business um uh, Brian had spent a lot of time in the States setting up Games Workshop US. Uh, the uh, stores uh, were starting to multiply and the, um, uh, I forget the name for the dealer program, um, but uh, anyway, the, the authorized dealers, you know, that whole, whole thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was, it was becoming far less of, a hobby at which we were somehow making a living and far more of a serious business. 
Mm. And uh, that's the cultural shift I remember. Um, there one or two more layers of management appeared. So, uh, uh, and it became a, a less clubby atmosphere and more, more stratified. Hmm. I suppose that's sort of almost a corporatization maybe of the yeah. organization. The, the, yeah, the first steps down that road, I think, and, you know, absolutely necessary as a, as a business grows. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't fault Games Workshop. It's, uh, it's served them very well. Certainly has, yeah. I mean, if if the growth and the sort of business is is the thing, I mean the mm. the, the sort of I imagine it became more difficult to get the the jokes into the books as that started to happen, and there were more managers signing stuff off. Yes, yes, it it did rather. Um, <laughs> although it forced us, particularly uh, Tony, Mike, and I at Flame, because we all had a strong uh, sense of mischief in our souls. It forced us, it, it turned into a sort of an arms race, if you will, where we were trying to sneak jokes in that, that wouldn't be recognized by management, but which would resonate with the, uh, the Wolfrop GMs and players. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we got regular memos saying this is, you know, like uh, Graham Chapman in Monty Python, stop that, it's silly. Because <laughs> Warhammer was Warhammer was trying to take itself far more seriously, uh, you know, as a, a a fantasy IP and as a setting, and uh, that was the first step down the road towards Grimdark. Hmm. And as that became more serious on the sort of battlefield, as it were, was hmm. there anything from a story perspective or a, a sort of law perspective that you were kind of getting a bit of pushback on and weren't able to do, or was it still quite open? to create new stuff um by the time i left flame in 1990 it was still very open um you know people didn't mind much what we did to the setting because uh the uh role-playing game worked on a smaller scale uh in terms of you know how much world real estate it used and so um you know, we didn't do anything that was world changing. And yeah, we could sort of uh, put something, a, a little building over here that does this. And, you know, I mean, Castle Drakenfels um, came from the uh, the novels to the role playing game. And then I think Constant Drakenfels, I know he's in uh, Total War Warhammer, and I think he might have been statted for other editions of the game uh the lich master went from battle to role play and back again um and and so on uh so no there wasn't anything we felt we should put we should push back on at that time um and then uh of course uh flame closed down uh, a couple of years passed hogshead got the license and from my conversations with james wallace uh, about that period uh, any pushback always came from games workshop you know obviously because they were the license holder um, but at that point any new role playing material was subjected to quite considerable scrutiny uh, as to how it would impact the the parent ip Sure. Yeah, I guess that was when it became a lot more structured, I suppose, in terms of an IP. Uh, yeah, like yes. Yeah. Structured is a good word for, for both the IP and the business. Hmm. And that that Hogshead era, I know you weren't necessarily uh, as involved as you had been during the, the flame times, but they obviously, Anthony Reagan actually did produce that Marienburg book in the end and sort of draw on some yep. of those notes and that sort of stuff. Was there anything that made its way into the Hogshead run that... that uh, was stuff that you'd been working on and, and sort of finally saw the light of day at that point, or was it mostly new? Um, well, a lot of the Hogshead run was reprints. Uh, you know, he re uh, James reprinted the enemy within campaign as you would. Um, and, uh, the doomstones, uh, the new thing was, a an ending for the doomstones. He got Robin laws to, to write episode five. Um, and uh, I had actually put together a, 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 an outline for, for Doom to, Doomstones 5 when I was at Flame. 
Uh, and I know Robin saw that and used parts of it and didn't use other parts. Um, I actually uh, worked on Apocrypha 2, uh, which was partly a compilation of uh, stuff from White Dwarf and Warhammer Companion and, you know, all the old other Bits and Bobs products. Um, and I think I managed to get a couple of, of new things into there, although, honestly, I can't quite remember what they were now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the Marienburg book and Dying of the Light, and of course, finally producing something with the title Realms of Sorcery. Uh, that was what Hogshead did, uh, that was original. <laughs> and then that Wolf Rob was, was reprinted again for uh, Fantasy Flight, and there was quite a different system when they did their third edition, uh, yes. I think. and then now as you mentioned before, Cubicle 7 are sort of republishing it and have, have taken bits of the first and second editions and and are mm -hmm. sort of revisiting a lot of the classics, I guess, which you've been involved with in uh, those sort of reprints on some of those books as well, haven't you? Yes, yes, I have. Um, yeah, the, the way uh, things emerged in my, my discussions with uh, Don McDowell of Cubicle 7 was that, um, you know, everybody liked the setting from first edition Everybody liked the mechanics from second edition. Uh, not very many people liked very much about third edition. Uh, so let's blend, you know, first and second to make fourth. And they got Andy Law in to do that and, and various other very talented people. Uh, and I think they did a, a great job. Um, so, uh, you know, when I heard that this fourth edition was coming, uh, I got in touch with Dom and he said to me, how do you feel about doing a director's cut of The Enemy Within? Uh, which I was absolutely delighted because there had been many things I hadn't been happy with about the original. Plus, we'd had 30 years of playtesting, analysis and feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it was a great opportunity. So... Um, I got to work on, let me see, the five parts of the, the main campaign, plus each one came with a supplement of, uh, of uh, additional material. So, for example, the uh, Death on the Reich uh, adventure, the original had had the uh, River Life of the Empire supplement bound in. Um, we moved that to a separate book and then uh, added various other uh mixture of uh, of updated and completely new material to uh, to help you spend even more time going up and down the river trading and stuff um so it ended up in as as 10 volumes um took me i think two or three years to to get that done but it was uh, it was a lot of fun to do and i'm enormously proud of it especially because uh, the last two episodes. Now, the original Enemy Within, uh, the original plan was to have an adventure called The Horned Rat after Power Behind the Throne. Um, but that got supplanted because we had the chance to uh, have Ken Ralston write for us. And he was a very well-known uh, writer in the US at the time. And the thinking was that uh, he would, his name, would help uh, boost sales in the US, where, of course, our fight against uh, our competition with uh, AD&D was fiercest, trying to get a toehold. Um, so uh, he wrote something rotten in Kislev, and that was slotted into the, uh, the place that was supposed to have been for the Horned Rat. And then you know, commercial pressures piled up and everything. And it was uh, it was decided to get the campaign finished and done with as quickly as possible. So Flame's first task was to take a, a Carl Sargent manuscript for Empire in Flames and simply get that out. Uh, and it was rushed in the writing. It was rushed in the production. And nobody was really happy about it. James Wallace actually refused to reprint it. Uh, he planned to do uh, something called Empire in, Empire in Chaos, uh, all new. But that never happened by the time his license ran out. Uh, there's a fan written one by um, Mad Alfred Nunez, who's a, a Wolfram super fan, 
called uh, Empire at War. That's it's downloadable and well worth a look. Um, but to, to return circuitously to my actual point, uh, with the director's cut, I got to do The Horned Rat, uh, which was another sort of lost title that had been floating in the ether for, for decades. Because Games Workshop had this bad habit of announcing things before the writing had started. And then when they were cancelled or failed to appear, people were saying, you know, what's what's this? Um, so I got to do the Horned Rat and I got to reconcept the end of the campaign. Uh, I had a few conversations with Phil Gallagher, who I'm still in touch with on and off. And uh, we combined our patchy memories on, on both those titles and uh, produced a, an outline and I filled in the gaps. Um, so, yeah, essentially the director's cut allowed me to restore the campaign as best I could to its original intention. And I was very happy to do that. Yeah, that must have been a real uh, like sense of achievement to finally cap that yeah. campaign off. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I mean, the it, 10 volumes of, of that campaign. Have you done a, a full playthrough of that? How long does that take to complete? Uh, I don't know. But Andy <laughs> Andy Law is currently live streaming that very thing. Sure. Uh, and yeah, he's he's using all the resources, all 10 volumes, plus a bunch of stuff, because he was initially the developer on that project for uh, for Cubicle 7. Uh, and so he has ideas of his own that didn't make it into print. But uh, yeah, he's doing a live stream, and I, I forget how many thousands of people are watching it, but you can find it on YouTube. Uh, and we'll have to see how long it takes. Uh, I'm thinking probably three or four years at least. <laughs> Surely, yeah, because there's just so much quality material to explore in there. <laughs> so that's great. And one other thing that I wanted to just touch on was that you mm. did work on a, a, and it's a completely separate topic, but you did a, a fighting fantasy book as well. Um, yes, I did. Midnight Rogue. What, yeah. How did you end up writing that book? And I know, I suppose also, how different is it writing a game book to writing a role playing book? Right. Um... Well, you know, obviously I've been aware from aware of fighting fantasy from the beginning. Uh, and I kept an eye on game books. For Imagine Magazine, I, I co-wrote an article on game books with uh, Colin Greenland, who was their fiction critic at the time. Um, and actually through a chance encounter in a Durham pub, I ended up doing a, a game book spot on the BBC Radio Newcastle Children's Book Programme for a little while. Hey. Um uh, and when I moved down to Nottingham, uh, we didn't see much of Steve and Ian because they were still in London and, and mostly focused on uh, fighting fantasy because, you know, Brian was, was running the, uh, the show now. Um, but they did come up from time to time for board meetings. And uh, I had a couple of conversations with Steve and got on with him really well. And he'd seen my, I'd written for uh, Warlock magazine and. Um, which uh, had mo also moved to Nottingham. Mark Gascoigne was sitting at a desk opposite mine editing that. Um, and so, you know, it just sort of progressed. I wrote a few articles. I wrote a 200 paragraph adventure for the magazine. And uh, I said to Mark, you know, who would I talk to about getting to write an actual book? And he put me in touch with Puffin and uh, off we went. Uh, here's an interesting piece of trivia. Um, the original working title for Midnight Rogue was Prince of Thieves. This was before the Kevin Costner movie. Uh, but Ian vetoed that on the grounds that, uh, you know, he had his book City of Thieves. And I thought my title was a tribute to that because it was also set in Port Blacksand. Uh, but he didn't want to, to lose any sales through confusion of the titles so uh puffin decided it would be called midnight rogue oh, right okay <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and it, it's quite unusual in that it's one of the it's, it's a it's a fight of fantasy but where you're playing a sort of anti-hero right you're you're mm. not an out and out good guy in the book right so yeah. what sort of gave you the idea to tackle this the, the a game book structure in that way uh, well, basically, it was because I still had my woofer head on. And I thought that, 
you know, let's have a go at making doing Wolfrop in fighting fantasy. <laughs> and that's that's the the long and the short of it. I was obsessed with uh, city adventures and uh, and rogue type adventures at the time, and I just wanted to do one of those. Um, and I did. And uh, the initial feedback from Puffin was that uh, I remember this line in their feedback letter saying, we need more combat. It is fighting fantasy after all. Whereas I'd made it far too sneaky and it was possible to get through the whole thing without a combat in the first draft if you were smart and sneaky. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I rewrote it. The second draft had a lot more combat in and a, a little mini dungeon at the end. Um, as to the experience of writing it, uh, it's the same as I found with writing fiction is that there isn't a GM. So you can't, you, you can't kind of shirk anything and say, you know, this is for the GM to decide, or, you know, <laughs> according to the tastes of your gaming group or any of the, all of those let outs, um, are, uh, are closed to you. So you have to, you have to cover everything. Um, and I remember making a, an enormous flow chart on a, a piece of A3 paper in very small writing showing where all the, the different paragraphs linked up. And I had a, a I hand wrote out uh, all the numbers from one to 400 and crossed them off as I used them. And um, so a very different writing process from a, a tabletop role playing adventure, but uh, still a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, I imagine as much fun as it, it must be, it's also, it sounds like there's a certain amount of stress in in trying to write a game book that maybe doesn't exist in quite the same way for other you, types of fiction and games. No, you, you have to be very organized and keep track of things because, uh, you know, once you lose a connection, it's like knitting. You basically have to pull the whole thing apart and start again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you you've then went on to do lots of other work across rpgs and the sort of rpg industry and um, mm. and many other things over time but more recently you've been working with nant games i think it is on their That's Mythwalker right. game what what's sort of how have you ended up working on that kind of video game space and and how does that differ from role-playing games right well um for this, we need to go back to about 1993, uh, which is when I started. Uh, well, let's say 1991, I, I got some freelance contracts to write a story for a, a video game called Castles, uh, an old interplay game, which was basically um, a resource management game where you're building a castle and you have to decide, um, you know, how, ma how many uh, troops you have guarding the castle while it's being built, how many workers, how you feed them, how you, all the resources and everything else. Um, and they had storylines uh, in this one expansion that I, I worked on uh, called the Northern Campaign. And it was basically, it developed out of my game book writing because, again, it was... Um, interactive fiction it was uh, numbered paragraphs to all intents and purposes you made choices you know it's, instead of flipping to another page the uh, computer just showed you the next bit um, so the writing process was very similar to that and that was my first uh, foray into computer games and then by about 1993 um, microprose uk had become basically games workshop in exile Mike Brunton was there, Jim Bamber was there, Stephen Hand, the designer of Chainsaw Warrior and Fury of Dracula, he was also there. And uh, I, uh, I was looking to return to the UK for family reasons and others. Uh, and so uh, they got me an interview and I got a job there and I worked there for a little while. Um, didn't last long, sadly, not long enough for me to get a title out because... Uh, Microprose at the time, as, as uh, video gamers probably know, specialized in doing combat flight sims. Um, not the only thing they did, but it's what they were known for. And they had a competitor called Spectrum Holobyte, who also did combat flight sims, and who purchased Microprose, both UK and US, with the sole intention of shutting them down. Right. So that, that happened, and we were all made redundant. Um, 
But then uh, I got another job in the States in a company where Ken Ralston was working, who, of course, I'd met when he was in Britain writing Something Rotten in Kislev. And also working there were old D&D luminaries like uh, Lawrence Schick and Zeb Cook. Um, and we were doing CD-ROM games. Um, I started doing one uh, combat RPG based on the Highlander franchise because the TV series was going great guns at that time. Right. Um, but uh, as is often the case in the industry, the money ran out, the company went bust, and the game was never finished. Um, but, yeah, so I've been sort of – I've had a foot in – in either camp tabletop and uh, digital gaming ever since um and uh so uh, yeah i've racked up something like uh 40 video game titles that have actually shipped um and uh that half of my resume brought me to the attention of uh of nant games which is a a new company but based uh, on people who used to work on titles like everquest and halo Right. And um, uh, they're a sister company of Nant Studios, who owns the sound stages where The Mandalorian is filmed, and they're uh, very big into TV and film production. Okay. Um, and um, so, since uh, July of last year, I've been helping. Um, it's it's a curious parallel to my work on Woofrap. Actually, I arrived with a to see a, a setting in development and was asked to take over development of it, uh, the setting and storyline as the lead narrative designer. Um, so I'm doing that. Uh, it was announced just last week. It's uh, currently in a closed beta test and I'm very, very restricted in what I can say about it, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if anyone is interested, uh, go to... Uh, mythwalker.com and you will see uh all the currently available information on the game uh a couple of trailers and i apologize in advance i appear in both of them uh, <laughs> but um yeah i'm i'm having a, a great time with it that's terrific because i mean I don't, I don't know how much you you can say about the world that it's it's set in but it's a is it a fantasy setting and it's it's sort of it is yeah. yeah it's it's a fantasy world and uh the uh, the game itself is a mobile game uh with a strong geolocation element um so uh you know as with games like pokemon go you're walking around this world but you're also interacting with the other world and um so uh there's an element of uh going to be an element of mythology to it um and I'm really skirting close to what I think I'm sure. allowed to yeah. say here, but That's okay. but yeah, it's it's a fantasy world that lies on the other side of the veil, and uh, which you can view through your device and you know help resolve a big crisis that is the main storyline. That's fun. I mean, that it sounds then like there is definitely the echoes of of working on a a role playing game mm. in that kind of video game making. I suppose yes it's, it's a similar sort of discipline even though your your pen and paper has become the sort of code and, and all that sort of stuff there's still a must be a similar way to tackle the problems that come up in that sort of writing process oh yes definitely um you know and as with with fiction and and game books you can't rely on an external gm you've got to uh so that's the big sort of you, more discipline is required in designing quests and scenarios and so on uh at the same time, you've got to uh, sort of like the Truman Show. You can't have people finding the wall. Uh, you know, it's got to look completely open world um, and completely free while guiding people along the storyline subtly. Uh, so that's the big writing challenge. But yeah, to all intents and purposes, it is uh, a role playing game. We're calling it a GRPG, a geolocation role playing game. Um, so you create and develop characters and so on. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so far it's been a lot of fun. It sounds great. Yeah. And then is there anything, 
I was going to ask then about just going back to Wolfrop for a moment. Mm. Obviously, having come back to that after a number of years and been able to complete the enemy within and, and sort of see Cubicle 7 sort of live up to that. And obviously, you've also updated some of your adventures and, and written some more stuff for those. Is there any chance there might ever be more of your work in the in the Wolfrop space, do you think? Um, I don't know. That's that's a question for uh, for Cubicle 7 or right. whoever succeeds them as, as the license holder. Um, I've, you know, ever since the, uh, basically the fans kept Wolfram 1 alive in the hiatus between Flame and Hogshead. And ever since then, I felt, you know, quite humbled by that and by the, uh, the passion and devotion that Wolfram has inspired. So, yeah, if if I'm able and if called upon, I'm always happy to return to that world. Uh, but I have to say there are no immediate plans. Sure. Well, certainly one I'll be keeping my fingers crossed for there. Um, but mm -hmm. that's terrific, Graham. Thank you so much for, for taking some time to chat to me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Huge thanks go out to Graham Davis for taking the time to talk to me, sharing so many fun stories and such a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I have learned so much stuff here that is going to inform my upcoming series on the history of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, so keep an eye on the channel for that. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to support my continuing work documenting the greatest games ever made and speaking to the legends who made them, then consider checking out my Patreon, my Ko-fi, or even just joining my Discord. I've put links to all of those down below in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to Graham Davis once again. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. <laughs> <laughs>